Hello, I'm Jaren Stratford from the Recover Administrative Coordinating Center and the moderator for today's webinar. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the Recover Research Review or R3 seminar. The goal of this webinar series is to catalyze a shared understanding of the research within the Recover Consortium. Uh, the topic of today's seminar is metabolism and the gastrointestinal function in PASC. Um, it is important to note that this seminar series is focused on scientific research and is not intended to provide any clinical guidance. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone who submitted questions in advance. Uh, if you do have any additional questions that arise uh, during the discussions today, uh, please feel free to put those into the Q&A and Zoom. Um, after the presentations, we will answer as many of those questions about today's topics um, and presentations as possible. Um, some questions may also be answered uh, within the Q&A. Uh, a frequently asked questions document for this seminar will be posted with the recording on the seminar on recovercovid.org. Uh, it will include answers for questions relevant to the seminar that uh, we weren't able to discuss during the meeting today. Uh, questions about scientific topics will be addressed in future seminars um, and answers to broader questions about recover will be available within the FAQs. Uh, today's speakers will discuss what is known about metabolism and gastrointestinal function in PASC, the gaps in our, our knowledge, and how recovery will contribute to filling these knowledge gaps. Today, we will hear from a number of seminar speakers, including Dr. Clifford Rosen, a physician scientist and director of the clinical and translational research at the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. Dr. Rosen is a member of the FDA advisory panel on endocrinology and meta metabolic drugs, and a former chairperson of that committee. He has also overseen numerous phase two and three clinical trials and runs a basic and research, a basic and translational research laboratory focused on understanding the relationship between bone cells and fat cells in the bone marrow. Uh, Dr. Jane Roosh, the associate director and cent of the Center for Women's Health Research at the University of Colorado Anschultz Medical Cent Campus, will also speak to us today. Her research focuses on understanding the cellular metabolism of diabetes and its complications, including cardiac, vascular, and skeletal muscle dysfunction. Dr. Emily Gallagher uh, is an associate professor of endocrinology, diabetes, and bone disease at the Eichen School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Her research interests focus on how systemic metabolic conditions promote cancer growth and metastasis, and how systematic differences in metabolism may contribute to racial disparities in cancer survival. She runs an onco-endocrinology clinical practice treating the endocrine and metabolic complications of cancer and cancer therapies. Uh, we will also be joined today by two discussants, uh, Dr. Philip Shearer, the director of the Touchstone Diabetes Center and interim chair of the Department of Cell Biology at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Uh, current efforts in his laboratory focus on identification and characterization, characterization of novel proteins involved in whole body energy homeostasis, inflammation, cancer, and cardiovascular disease with the aim of identifying novel targets for pharmacological intervention and to further define the role of adipose tissue as an endocrine organ. Uh, we will also be joined by Dr. Lucio Mele. And he is the head of the genetics department at, the, at Louisiana State University Health Sciences Center and serves as assistant dean of the School of Medicine for Translational Science. His research interests include developmental therapeutics, cancer genomics, viral genomics, surveillance, and big data COVID-19 research that links socioeconomic, biological, and clinical data sets. He is currently serving as the co-chair for the Recover Omics Committee. And with that, we'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Rosen and we'll begin. Thank you very much, uh, Jaron. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. This is a group effort. Some of the work we presented will include some of the other people's name on here. What I'm going to do today is just in 10 minutes, give you a brief overview of metabolic dysfunction and uh, uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID. And I'm gonna talk principally about endocrine gland dysfunction because in principle, the five endocrine glands that uh, control our body also control a lot of the uh, 
uh, symptoms that uh, could relate to uh, PASC and may be important in recover. I'm gonna focus my brief presentation on three of the laboratory studies that we uh, get from participants in recover. Uh, and these three laboratory tests are the free thyroid and TSH measurements, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D and glucose heme hemoglobin A1C. And these tests will give us a, just a brief overview of where we think uh, metabolic dysfunction may play a role in some of the symptomatology of PASC and also may be important in early detection of long COVID. So just to remind you, there are really five major endocrine glands and all of them can be affected by uh, infection with a virus or as a post-infection, uh, it relates to antibody uh, production uh, that would attack uh, the tissues. Uh, the thyroid, the parathyroids in which vitamin D axis is important, the adrenal glands and the gonadal steroids as well as the pituitary. And each of these glands in case reports have been associated with dysfunction or uh, uh, hyperfunction uh, during the course of either acute COVID or in the immediate post-acute sequelae. As I said, I'm gonna focus principally on thyroid and vitamin D and briefly give you an overview of some recent uh, data uh, we've acquired on the characteristics of type two diabetes in uh, individuals uh, who have long COVID. So uh, one of the most commonly reported uh, endocrine complication of uh, acute COVID infection is subacute thyroiditis. And we've known about subacute thyroiditis for many years. It occurs post-viral infections. It's associated with a fever, usually with neck tenderness, a very high sed rate. And it's characterized by destruction of uh, transiently of thyroid follicles with the release of thyroid hormone. So individuals go through a phase of significant thyrotoxicosis as the thyroid hormone is released. Uh, but unlike other kinds of thyroid uh, diseases, uh, particularly Graves' disease, that uh, phase is transient. And it's followed, as you can see in the uh, middle uh, graphic, by a period of, uh, of hypothyroidism in which the gland has released all of its thyroid and then the individual becomes hypothyroid, ultimately becoming euthyroid over time. And this, uh, there are about 10% of individuals who will remain persistently hypothyroid. The reason this is so important is because this can be missed at different phases post-infection. Uh, uh, with any viral infection, uh, the post-infective phase uh, can be very transient as hyperthyroid or hypothyroid. And in each case, fatigue is a major complaint. So thyroid function tests, both 3T4 and TSH, are important in screening for this potential abnormality, particularly with a very high SED rate. Now, the prevalence of subacute thyroiditis post uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection is not known. A recent uh, series uh, from uh, India reported that among uh, 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 over uh, 600 patients that were initially followed with COVID, about 11% developed, 11 developed uh, subacute thyroiditis for a rate of about 6.8%. But one of the unknowns uh, is really how prevalent is subacute thyroiditis following uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and is it greater than uh, other viral infections that lead to subacute thyroiditis? In addition to post-infective uh, subacute thyroiditis, there are now several case reports of subacute thyroiditis following uh, vaccination. Uh, and it's unclear exactly what the prevalence of this is, but it's also been reported that there is a uh, rate of uh, post-vaccination Graves' disease. And again, the difference distinguishing between post-vaccination infection, if it's, if it's real, and post-viral infection may be semantics, but actually could be very important. So uh, I've been collaborating with the group in Italy that, are, that have uh, followed the consecutive series of 64 patients referred uh, to St. Raphael's Hospital in Milan for uh, Graves' disease. It's a tertiary medical center, and so they accumulate cases of Graves' disease. And as you know, know Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism, and it's associated with very positive thyroid antibodies. 
in 20 of the 64 individuals, uh, uh, those that uh, that those 20 uh, had a history of a vaccination within four weeks of the onset of Graves' disease, uh, and they were somewhat different in characteristics to what is considered classic Graves' disease. And in fact, they had lower titer of antibodies, thyroid uh, receptor antibodies, uh, lower uh, free T3, were more male uh, than female, and had a faster remission rate. So unfortunately, and this paper is under review currently, we still don't know if these were individuals that also had a chronic low-grade or subacute infection with SARS-CoV-2 since antibodies were not done. But these data are, are out there along with uh, several other case reports of this post-vaccination Graves disease. The second thing I'd like to discuss is vitamin D. So vitamin D receptors are present on every tissue uh, in vitro and in some in vivo studies, uh, activation of the vitamin D receptor can have in, an impact on the innate immune system as well as the adaptive immune system. And so uh, many people have considered the use of supplemental vitamin D as an approach to both treat acute COVID infections and reduce severity as well as individuals uh, taking it uh, who develop uh, long COVID symptoms. And most of our cohorts that we see and recover are taking some form of vitamin D with ranges of supplementation from 1,000 units to as much as 50,000 units a day. Uh, the evidence that vitamin D may have an impact on COVID is based on uh, a fair amount of cross-sectional data, which suggests that low 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels predict a greater risk of uh, mechanical ventilation um, or serious uh, COVID infection during the acute phase. However, 25-hydroxy vitamin D is bound to vitamin D binding protein, and uh, it, uh, it goes down vitamin D binding protein with acute illness. So the uh, predictive value of this is mitigated uh, as a serum marker for acute COVID. We looked at this in N3C, uh, the, uh, the degree of uh, vitamin D supplementation among hospitalized patients, and we were unable to find a protective effect of vitamin D supplementation on acute COVID-2 patients who were hospitalized. In fact, there was a greater risk of uh, length of stay and mechanical ventilation, uh, even after uh, controlling for a number of different covariates. Unfortunately, though, um, the uh, this could be uh, complicated by uh, the fact that more uh, sick the patients are, the more likely they are to get other treatments such as, uh, such as vitamin D in an attempt to, to make them better. But there are two very good randomized controlled trials. One gave 100,000 units of vitamin D uh, uh, during hospitalization and showed that there was no impact on the prevention of complications and a second study, which is currently on MedArchive, um, is really a very important study, 6,300 subjects um, who, who had low vitamin D levels to begin with uh, were given either no treatment, 800 units or 3,200 units of vitamin D. And as you can see on the left-hand side, vitamin D levels increased, but there was no impact on the acute COVID recovery or clinical sequelae, and importantly, for the first time, some evidence that it did not impact at all symptoms of long COVID. So finally, I'd like to just finish, and you'll hear a lot more about this from the other speakers, on the bidirectional relationship between glucose intolerance and COVID-2. We know that uh, it, diabetic individuals are 30% more likely to develop uh, long COVID symptoms we're interested in understanding those individuals who did not have diabetes initially. And so we've been using a platform using um, AI and machine learning uh, of almost a million uh, uh, EHR records from the Mayo Clinic through uh, Enference, which is a company in Boston that works with Harvard. And um, they've been able to scan data and look for what the characteristics of diabetic individuals are who do not have diabetes longitudinally prior to infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2. And not surprising in 1400 individuals that they detected with new onset type two diabetes, uh, essential hypertension and obesity were major risk factors for development of type two diabetes. We then went ahead and, and we just did this last week, we, 
compared uh, post-influenza uh, type 2 diabetes in 2019 versus post-SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection uh, in, uh, with type 2 diabetes and found that those individuals that had infected with SARS-CoV-2 had significantly greater body mass index, uh, 35 versus 24, and uh, considerably uh, higher blood sugars and hemoglobin A1Cs than those individuals with SARS-CoV that had post-influenza type 2 diabetes. So in conclusion, uh, multiple endocrine glands can uh, be affected by COVID-2, both as a direct infection or as a post-autoimmune type infection. Subacute thyroiditis can occur post-COVID-2, as can Graves' disease, and the relationship to vaccination still needs to be determined. There's no evidence from randomized controlled trials that vitamin D has any impact on the clinical course of acute COVID-2 or uh, on long COVID symptoms. Uh, glucose intolerance is secondary to immune response and that glucose intolerance may be more severe post SARS-CoV-2 infection than other type of viral infections. Thanks, Dr. Rosen. Uh, now we'll have uh, Dr. Roosh. I really appreciate Dr. Rosen um, insisting that I talk today because um, I, I want to share a little bit about where we're going with Recover in terms of looking at incident diabetes, deterioration of diabetes and diabetes remission, um, and, and then also share a small mechanistic RO1 that is driven by many of these um, factors that Cliff has started to discuss and that others will discuss in, in more detail. So um, when you're thinking about the Recover uh, cohort and trying to understand what are going to be the long-term sequelae of, of a, a, a COVID infection, either severe or mild, we want to look to the early indicators that we had in the pandemic, which is early in the pandemic, it became very clear that people with diabetes had worse outcomes than people without diabetes. And, um, and, and in addition, there appeared to be about a 19 to 20% uh, increase in incidence of, of new onset hyperglycemia that would meet the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. So, so that already for diabetologists among us and me in particular, really sort of said, we've got to pay a lot of attention to this pandemic in terms of its long-term consequences for people living with diabetes. And so um, I, I work with a number of intensivists who I work with very closely looking at endothelial dysfunction. And so wanted to say, what do we think that we know about sepsis and the intersection between sepsis, obesity, and diabetes? And um, we see a lot of profound increases in insulin requirements in, in sepsis. Um, and we see uh, increased gluconeogenesis and decreased muscle insulin sensitivity, but we also see uh, an attempt by the pancreas to increase insulin secretion. Um, mainly all the models without actual physical testing of insulin secretion versus insulin sensitivity suggests that insulin resistance is the predominant factor in a sepsis mediated hyperglycemia. So when we look at the early onset of, of, of sepsis, we see increased inflammation, we see uh, decreased anti-inflammation, and then there's a recovery towards a homeostatic uh, inflammatory milieu. But those of us who live in the world of diabetes know that people with diabetes have persistent and constant um, and inflammatory milieu. So when we're thinking about how COVID might interact with diabetes, there's been a number of models put forward in 2020, in 2021, in 2022, and, um, and they, they, they indict a few different things. First, that we see that there's a more severe cytokine storm in, in people with diabetes, that, and that goes along with market insulin resistance. But then there's also been a question and a major debate in the literature of whether or not um, there, there is direct SARS-CoV-2 infection of the beta cells or whether it is indirect. And, and, and the model I'm gonna present might suggest that it could be both, 
but that but that the the impact of SARS um, on the microvasculature is something very important. There's also, as Cliff just mentioned, a lot of uh, in interactions between between um, comorbid conditions, including hypertension, obesity. And then there's been a peculiar and interesting effect that looks like um, this, is, this is differentially impacting people by sex. So when we then move forward to what do we know about sepsis in the context of diabetes is that we're starting with a higher pro-inflammatory and lower anti-inflammatory milieu. And then you could expect an exaggerated response, which might in fact be persistent, which is why when I first started hearing about long COVID, I was very concerned that people with diabetes may experience additional burden from long COVID. So let's take a look at um, in a little bit more detail about the acute hyperglycemia that can present in a COVID infection. And this is an Italian study, but really excitingly, one of the best studies to actually look at insulin secretion, as well as to via home analysis insulin action. And what they showed in these individuals were that in uh, over 500, they had a, a, a pretty high proportion of people higher than that 19% that had new onset hyperglycemia without pre-existing diabetes, at least by chart review. That new onset hyperglycemia in this smaller subset that was studied in more detail persisted in some of these people out at two months. So it's important to note that this study is at two months. And, the, and, and for these people, what we found was that their hospitalization was slightly different. The people with diabetes had more or higher baseline poor clinical score. But what was really interesting and very interesting to me in terms of diffuse endothelial dysfunction was that people who required oxygen support had a more, like, more likelihood of hyperglycemia, people who had um, uh, ventilatory support and people who were in the ICU. But mo and, and interestingly, and I just got lucky when I laid out my proposal, I wanted to think of diffuse need for oxygen support in a patient population as a metric of diffuse endothelial injury in that population. Um, in these patients, what was really exciting was that this group used an arginine uh, stimulus to increase insulin secretion. So that's insulin reserve. It's not the same as glucose-mediated insulin secretion. But what they showed was that in the setting of acute um, COVID, there was an increased insulin secretion, an increased um, beta cell um, demand, um, and, and there was also insulin resistance by a calculated HOMA IR measure. But what was really interesting was that there was this hyperinsulinemic response to, to the arginine very, very acutely, suggesting that there may be a high metabolic demand or high, a high insulin secretion in these people, which is something we have seen in youth at risk for type two diabetes and rapid progression in, in, in the RISE study. So the questions that I feel like we recover as well as my R01 is attempting to address are, what are the implications of diffuse endothelial injury? COVID specifically infects the endothelium. That's not controversial in any way. And when this, this COVID endothelial infection collides with the existing pre-diffuse pre, um, endothelial injury, we see an even uncomplicated diabetes. So is sepsis-related hyperglycemia different with COVID? Will it persist or will it remit? We've seen some remission already at two months. Um, and, and will it have implications for the progression, most importantly to me, of diabetes-related cardiovascular and microvascular complication? Will it be a new cardiovascular risk factor when we're using cardiovascular risk factor engines? And so let's take a quick lesson from the, pre, the, the preeclampsia. So preeclampsia really struck me as a parallel for COVID because it is an acute time-limited diffuse endothelial injury like a COVID infection may be, um, but it has long-term sequelae. And the long-term sequelae that we see are increased outpatient visits, so a lot more outpatient visits, 
um, increased a hazard ratio of cardiovascular disease and increased relationship to hypertension. And does this sound familiar? It sounded very familiar to me with post-COVID syndrome. So um, in, in an article that I thought that Cliff was gonna show earlier, they had shown in 3,700 people, increased incidence of, 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 of new onset diabetes post COVID. And in a, in a larger US veteran population that has been seen again. So with these earlier studies were not US population and here is a US population. So in the US, in, nine, in 2017 or 2018, when I was president of the American Diabetes Association, there were 30.3 million people in the US living with diabetes. Now there are 37.3 million. So already we have a crazy escalating epidemic. So if we add a, 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 a point, anywhere between 0.25 and 0.5 increased likelihood, this could be a major public health uh, problem. So one perspective that was very interesting to me by Peter Libby and Tom Lucher was that COVID is in the end an endothelial disease. So if we think of a healthy endothelium, it, has, it, 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 it promotes cardiovascular, pulmonary, brain, and, um, and renal health. But the minute that you are disrupting endothelial function and activating endothelial cells, what you will see is a cavalcade of effects, all of which more greatly affect people with diabetes. Now in my research with Dr. Regensteiner and more recently with Dr. Nadeau in pediatric endocrinology, we have been looking at the interaction between type two diabetes and decreased functional exercise capacity, seeing the impact on cardiac dysfunction and skeletal muscle dysfunction that be, can be explained a lot by heterogeneous tissue perfusion, which is what people see in sepsis and what we see probably more, more so in people with a COVID um, related serious infection. So the R01 that we put together uh, was looking at COVID and incident diabetes and, and was looking at the relationship between systemic endothelial injury and insulin secretion and insulin action, as well as skeletal muscle function. So our overarching hypothesis is that COVID-19 deleteriously impacts carbohydrate metabolism and skeletal muscle function due to systemic perfusion abnormalities worse in diabetes and hyperglycemia and post-hospitalization of recovery will be slowed in the context of hyperglycemia-mediated persistent endothelial injury. So when we're thinking about the beta cell and the islet within the beta cell, sometimes we forget that in addition to alpha cells and beta cells, what we have in the islet vasculature is a very responsive microvasculature. So as shown in these slides by Al Powers group, um, what we see is in hyperglycemia, if you're looking at the perfusion in an islet, you will see higher perfusion with hyperglycemia, lower perfusion with hypoglycemia. So you could imagine that if you don't have the ability to regulate uh, perfusion because of diffuse endothelial injury, you might disrupt glucose sensing and or have a deleterious effect on, on insulin secretion. So AIM-1 of our R01, which we can be further supported by data generated under the RECOVER study, is to look at, at um, insulin secretion and action post-hospitalization over, over three to now 12 months to see uh, about the intersection between persistent hyperglycemia and diffuse endothelial injury recovery in, in line with insulin action by, by an oral glucose tolerance test, as well as insulin secretion by the oral glucose tolerance test. There is an interaction that that is robust in the pancreas with, with diffuse endothelial injury that is even more strongly uh, seen in the skeletal muscle. So our second hypothesis is that dysglycemia and diffuse endothelial injury will, will um, disrupt uh, muscle recovery. And we know that we're seeing a lot of weakness and a lot more weakness in people with diabetes. So we have um, a bunch of research 
demonstrating that, that microvascular perfusion augments the decreased metabolic oxidative flux in people with diabetes. And we wanted to see if post-recovery COVID, that was the, those two pathways were interacting. So when you hit somebody with a severe acute illness, such as a COVID hospitalization, they will lose muscle mass and they may not completely recover. And we think that diabetes would exaggerate that and a COVID infection will exaggerate that. So there have been models put together about even people not getting COVID infection having, having decreased functional status. So in our, in, in our work under this aim, what we're going to do is we're going to use a very innovative um, design, MRI-based muscle perfusion, blood flow, and oxygen extraction developed by Dr. Aaron Englund, a talented bioengineer at the University of Colorado um, on, on skeletal muscle, on skeletal muscle, and then um, and then we will also be using our FOS, our MRI FOS labeling to study oxygen, um, oxygen, uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So we can we can do that with and without oxygen to see if 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 perfusion is limiting oxidative function in vivo. And this is based on data from our group showing that decreased oxidative function in vivo in people can be restored by simply giving them increased oxygen availability. So is there a simple bedside test for this diffuse endothelial injury? Well, of course, I wouldn't be asking that question if it wasn't one. So, the, so we'll be using a microscan device of sublingual intravital microscopy to look at microvascular perfusion under the tongue, which is a very similar um, embryological origin to the gut and, and the heart and skeletal muscle. And so, and so uh, these indices plus some serum markers of of diffuse endothelial injury may inform our question. So this work is gonna be done by me and Dr. Douglas, Rasuli and Albers. And so let's come back to what this might mean for recover. Well, the opportunity for recover is for us to understand what is the mechanism underlying incident diabetes? This is not a broad epidemiological study. It can be complemented by N3C, but we really want to have the opportunity to look at what is going on after COVID in terms of deterioration of diabetes and or diabetes remission. So I'm now gonna turn this over to Dr. Gallagher. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna take off where uh, Dr. Roosh uh, left off and talk a little bit about health disparities and diabetes and how it may be um, contributing to um, worse outcomes and long COVID and also how recovery is going to address uh, these issues. So these are my conflicts of interest, which are not directly related to COVID or uh, COVID related issues. So the objectives for what I'm gonna talk about are really to describe the racial and ethnic differences in SARS-CoV-2 outcomes um, and the potential influence of diabetes in affecting these outcomes. And secondly, to understand the role of recover and examining the links between SARS-CoV-2 and diabetes. So I'm gonna focus on two things. The first just being the racial and ethnic differences and the prevalence of diabetes overall and the associations with SARS-CoV-2. And secondly, evaluating the mechanisms of diabetes. So as Dr. Roche mentioned, um, it's important to try and figure out why people are getting diabetes um, in the setting of uh, COVID. So to begin with, um, you all probably remember, and at least I distinctly remember the first wave of COVID here in New York um, in March and April of 2020. Um, and this paper was from um, the group who examined the US statistics, national statistics, and looked at different phases over the course of the first two years of COVID. And what you can notice here is two things. I mean, the first, I think we all recognized immediately when COVID um, started and when patients started coming into the hospital was that the mortality was greatly increased uh, with age. And so this here on the y-axis you can see is a logarithmic um, axis. And so really there was an exponential increase in the mortality as people got older. What you can also see here is differences between racial and ethnic groups across the US. So the top here is men, and the, uh, the first uh, column is, is black men, um, Hispanic men in the middle, and then white men on the right-hand side, and women on the bottom. And so if you just look, for example, at 50-year-old um, Hispanic and black men, you can see here where the, uh, the line hits the y-axis of their mortality, which was much higher um, than if you look at the equivalent 50-year-old 
uh, white men during the first phase of the pandemic. And so there was an increase that we saw in mortality, both with age, and there was an obvious increase um, in different racial and ethnic groups. And obviously we know that there are a lot of social and access to healthcare issues that contribute to this, but one question was whether diabetes might also be contributing. So when you look across the US generally, um, you can see that the mortality, so this is um, compared to non-Hispanic white patients, and this is from the CDC data uh, that I downloaded yesterday. And so you can see that um, American Indian and Alaska Natives had an increased number of cases, hospitalizations, and mortality compared to non-Hispanic white. And the same with African-American or Black individuals, um, and the same with Hispanic individuals. And so we know previously from before COVID that there are um, differences in the prevalence of diabetes in the US. So here on the right-hand side is um, white, not Hispanic white men and women. And you can see that Hispanic, um, Black, and American Indian and Alaska Natives have much higher prevalences of diabetes. And this was before COVID. And then if you just superimpose the, the table that I previously showed you, you can see that those who have the highest prevalence of diabetes also had the highest risks of hospitalization and death with COVID. And so the question was, what was the, is there an association between the higher prevalence of diabetes in these groups and their higher mortality? So this is a very simplistic view of what uh, Dr. Roosh showed you already. And so that we know that pre-existing diabetes in individuals who developed SARS-CoV-2 was associated with an increased risk of mortality. What we still don't know is whether this is associated with an increased risk of long COVID. And we also know that people who had SARS-CoV-2 had an increased incidence of newly diagnosed diabetes. But was this associated with also long COVID? Was diabetes persistent and did they develop long-term diabetes? Um, and we do know that it was associated with an increased risk of mortality. So the references here on the bottom are not from this. This is just a simplified figure of, of what's in other papers, but this uh, review in diabetes care is an excellent review of this interaction between pre-existing diabetes, um, new onset diabetes, and mortality outcomes. And then the second paper is just from um, Mount Sinai here, where we looked at the new onset hyperglycemia in people who came in with the first wave and how it increased the ICU-associated um, mortality. So uh, there aren't that many studies looking at really how um, this interaction may be playing out across different racial and ethnic groups. So this is a study from MGH where they looked at the prevalence of newly diagnosed diabetes in individuals who are hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2. So here are the people with pre-existing diabetes are the blue columns and then the gray columns are people who developed new um, hyperglycemia or newly diagnosed diabetes when they enter the hospital. And so you can see it, the gray column here is highest in the Hispanic group. And so these people had the highest rates of new onset hyperglycemia after they were hospitalized. It's just notably in this study, um, the Hispanic and non-Hispanic white populations with the two largest populations. And the distribution here is just the distribution of um, across races of people who developed new diabetes or people who had pre-existing diabetes. Um, but you can see the Hispanic groups seem to have the largest risk of new onset of diabetes. There, this has been associated with an increased risk of mortality in, in other studies, but it wasn't uh, examined in this one. So then this is also the same study that Dr. Rue showed you, but just a different figure from it. So this is the one from uh, the VA study here in the US. And this looked at something different. So this wasn't new onset diabetes. This was people who had a risk factor for prolonged diabetes at 12 months. So people who developed diabetes and it persisted. So here you can see that um, they did not look at all across all racial and ethnic groups. They just looked at um, black or African-American individuals versus white. And they saw that um, black individuals had a higher risk of developing diabetes 12 months after the diagnosis of diabetes. So this seemed to be a risk factor for persistence of um, hyperglycemia. So what about um, other types of past? So then people who, um, developed hyperglycemia or had pre-existing diabetes, is it a risk factor for long COVID? So this study came out of UCLA um, and what they actually were looking at was not persistent diabetes, but they were looking at other symptoms of long COVID such as fatigue and shortness of breath. And what they found was that actually um, there wasn't an association between an increased risk with different racial or ethnic groups, but diabetes itself did increase the risk of long COVID. So it's possible that it's not, um, that long COVID is not specifically related to different racial or ethnic groups, groups, but it could be that the diabetes is actually increasing the risk. So what do we know or what do we think we know about SARS-CoV-2 and diabetes? 
Well, so far we do know that SARS-CoV-2 is associated with new onset hyperglycemia or newly diagnosed diabetes. And there is a little bit of a question on this. And some people, it may be spontaneously new hyperglycemia and other people, it may be people who did not see the doctor for a while or did not realize they had diabetes and therefore they came in with this inflammatory um, infection and it just brought out the diabetes diagnosis. Um, Pre-existing diabetes and or new onset hyperglycemia we do know is associated with an increased risk of hospitalization, intensive care unit admission and mortality. And then there may be racial or ethnic differences in the new onset of hyperglycemia or diabetes as suggested by some of these studies, although there's very little data on this. And then it seems, at least from, from some of the studies, that diabetes might be associated with an increased risk of long COVID. So what we still don't know um, is what percentage of people develop this new onset diabetes. Is it people, as I said, who had pre-existing diabetes to some extent, or um, who gets this worsening hyperglycemia? And what are the risk factors for developing this new onset of diabetes? Are there gender differences or racial or ethnic differences? Um, as I said, there's some data supporting differences in racial ethnicity um, contributing to this worsening of hyperglycemia, but it's there are very few studies looking at it. And then the question uh, that Dr. Roosh brought up, which was what are the mechanisms behind the development of diabetes in SARS-CoV-2? Um, why do people with diabetes um, potentially have a higher risk of long COVID? And does the acute hyperglycemia persist um, 12 months on or does it generally tend to resolve? So how are we going to evaluate the mechanisms of diabetes development with recover? So this is a simplistic view of um, how we think of diabetes generally. Um, and it's simplistic just because it kind of breaks it down into two things, either insulin deficiency or um, insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. So oftentimes it's not this straightforward and, and often there's a spectrum of um, some insulin resistance and partial insulin deficiency. Um, but this is just for the concept of trying to figure out kind of mostly what's happening with SARS-CoV-2. Is, um, is it an effect on the pancreas or is it more of a systemic effect on other metabolic tissues? So with Recover, um, the plan will be to do the uh, glucose tolerance tests. And the glucose tolerance tests are, we think of them as a way to diagnose diabetes where you give somebody a glucose drink and then you measure their glucose levels over the course of 120 minutes. Um, but what we can also do with this is look at um, insulin secretion over the initial phase, and then we can look at in, uh, glucose disposal or insulin sensitivity over the latter part. So in addition to measuring the glucose levels, um, what we do is we also measure the insulin and C-peptide. And so what people will do when they come for recover, if they meet the criteria of hyperglycemia or new onset diabetes, um, or worsening diabetes in people with pre-existing diabetes, then what they will do is come in for the glucose tolerance test and we'll be measuring the insulin levels and the C-peptide levels as well as their glucose levels. And basically based on these levels, I'm not gonna go through all the calculations, but you can kind of distinguish between beta cell dysfunction or insulin resistance. And so there's this insulinogenic index, which you can calculate over the first 30 minutes, um, which looks at insulin secretion. You can look at the C-peptide index, which is another measure of insulin secretion. And then this um, Matsuda DeFranzo index of insulin sensitivity can be calculated over the entire um, 120 minutes of the glucose tolerance test. So once we have the uh, kind of more information about why people are developing um, diabetes and whether it's more related to pancreatic insulin deficiency or whether it's more related to changes in insulin sensitivity, the next question will be what mechanisms potentially could be driving one or other of these. Um, um, our next speakers are going to actually probably address more of these factors, so I'm not going to get into them, but there are a number of factors that could potentially be contributing to either the in defects in insulin secretion or the insulin sensitivity changes. So to summarize, diabetes may be a contributing factor to worse outcomes in SARS-CoV-2 and potentially um, contribute to the differences in uh, racial and ethnic groups and their different outcomes with uh, COVID. The risk factors for new onset hyperglycemia in individuals with SARS-CoV-2 are not well understood, and the prognosis for those who develop new onset hyperglycemia is currently unknown. But through Recover, hopefully we can help answer some of these questions regarding the mechanisms of diabetes and new onset hyperglycemia. And thank you. So I think I'm handing over to Dr. Shearer. Thank you very much. So we have already fairly far advanced into the hour. So allow me to just uh, give a, a five minute sort of uh, um, summary from a basic perspective of what we've just heard from, from uh, the various speakers. Uh, just starting out here with uh, Dr. Rush's slide, 
about the fact that we have diabetes, obesity, predisposing individuals to a much worse prognosis overall. And the question is, of course, why is that? Uh, she has shown you a, rightfully uh, a lot of data on endothelial dysfunction, which might be one of the keys. Uh, our perspective uh, to complement that might be more related to the adipose tissue and the adipocytes specifically as a target for infection as well, and as a contributing factor to the systemic cytokine storm uh, that individuals with uh, diabetes uh, and, and obesity actually uh, have to undergo. We know the fat cell mostly in the context of its contribution to diabetes, to tumors as well, but then it plays an important role in infectious disease at multiple different levels as a target uh, for various parasitic infections, but also as a target for a host of uh, viral infections as well. And that actually, since adipose tissue is the biggest endocrine gland uh, that we have, and in some individuals makes up of, up to 50% of total body weight, this has to be taken, of course, very um, seriously. So very early on, actually, back in 2020, uh, we, we had a thought piece on adipocytes and adipocyte-like cells and their contribution to uh, pulmonary fibrosis, which was one of the key issues. And we emphasized at the time, the relatively recent discovery of the fact that fat cells can actually uh, not only shrink or increase in size or apoptose and necrose, they can also de-differentiate. And in the process of de-differentiation going over to a precursor state, these precursor cells can actually morph into what we refer myofibroblasts, and these myofibroblasts have very potent pro-fibrotic characteristics. So in the lung, for instance, we have uh, uh, lipofibroblasts, which are adipocyte-like cells, and they can actually differentiate, de-differentiate to myofibroblasts, and these myofibroblasts are a significant source of the fibrosis that individuals um, experience uh, within the lung, and of course, uh, that uh, significantly impairs the oxygen exchange. So in that context, uh, the, the adipocyte and adipocyte-like cells are potentially major target uh, targets basically to alleviate some of these symptoms. And an old fashioned way, which it still hasn't really been tested clinically in a systematic way, is uh, the anti diabetic drug class of thiazolidine diones. These are uh, activators of the transcription factor PPR gamma. Uh, PPR gamma exerts um, uh, pro adipogenic effects, but more importantly in this context, it also exerts potent anti fibrotic effects, potent anti inflammatory effects. Something we take advantage already in the context of fibrosis in the liver, uh, but which hasn't really been systematically tested in the context of uh, the cytokine storm in the acute phase, as well as the fibrotic. Uh, sequelae that follow uh, up on the infection in, in that particular context. So the thiazolidine dions uh, remain uh, an, an attractive uh, uh, possibility for the future, both for the acute as well as for the long-term um, alleviation of some of these symptoms. In addition, uh, we also heard uh, from Dr. Roush the um, uh, potential of sepsis as a contributing factor. Uh, this is pre-existing enhanced levels of endotoxins in the system. Uh, and we do appreciate that diabetics, obese individuals, have slower gastric motility, increased gastric permeability for bacterial debris. Uh, so we have a higher baseline levels of uh, level of endotoxin in the system. And when you combine that with the massive uh, TLR uh, mediated antiviral response, uh, we have several systems um, on at the same time, and they actually combined uh, between the endotoxin and the viral response, we have uh, probably an excellent explanation for the massive uh, uh, immune response uh, with respect to the cytokine storm that we experience. And presumably, much of that is long lasting in the context of PASC as well. So this uh, endotoxemia is appreciated um, as uh, being elevated in type 2 diabetics. We've known that for many years. But what we don't 
yet fully appreciate potentially is the contributions of that endotoxemia uh, to the uh, uh, potent inflammatory response in the context of uh, viral infection. Now, just to make the point uh, here towards the end of what tissues are majorly involved, the fat tissue is clearly involved. We have an overabundance of papers that, for instance, compare uh, uh, gastric bypass surgery uh, before and after um, the, the COVID pandemic, clearly uh, indicating that mortality is significantly reduced in patients that underwent the surgery prior to COVID-19, uh, 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 just uh, further emphasizing that the fat mass and its associated dysfunction plays a critical role in this context. This has also been highlighted by a host of papers that actually show that the virus can directly infect um, fat cells, adipocytes, and turn their pro-inflammatory response on, along with all the other important uh, cells within adipose tissue that include a lot of macrophages and endothelial cells, as well as pre-adipocytes that contribute to the cytokine storm in an acute setting as well. Some of the critical factors that fat, cell, the fat cells produce are essential regulators of the immune system, particularly leptin is actually something that plays a major role in the inflammatory response response as well. And when I think about leptin-based interventions in this context as well, we heard about the beta cells and various other components in the islets that can also be direct targets for viral infection and change their fate as well as their ability to actually produce and release um, insulin. And uh, again, together with Dr. Rosen and Perman here, um, we, we sort of summed a lot of that up in this particular perspective here in eLife that um, we recently published and sort of mused about the consequences of all of that for uh, long COVID and, and how that will uh, be affecting the metabolic dysfunctions uh, that are fairly characteristic of people uh, long-term uh, post-COVID uh, uh, exposure. And with that, I want to let Dr. Miele uh, uh, hop in with his summary. This has been a fascinating discussion so far, and I'm going to bring you the perspective of how the omics group has been thinking about these things. Uh, we have discussed metabolic dysfunction uh, as both a risk factor as well as a consequence uh, of both acute SARS-CoV-2 as well as uh, long COVID. How do we measure that in addition to, uh, and do we even need additional measurements in addition to oral glucose tolerance test, insulin, C-peptide? Uh, we can do targeted metabolomics to look more in depth at glucose uh, and amino acid and fatty acid metabolism uh, in uh, FASC patients. Uh, untargeted metabolomics, at least in the opinion of the experts in our group, may actually decrease our sensitivity in terms of being able to detect uh, pathogenetically relevant metabolites. So our consensus would be to use targeted metabolomics that are guided by the pathophysiological hypothesis that we've heard about uh, during the discussion today. Now, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is the role of the microbiome. Now, there is going to be collection of intestinal microbiome samples. Uh, as you know, the microbiome affects a number of key physiological processes uh, that are involved or potentially involved in, in both acute uh, um, COVID-19 and PASC. Uh, it affects immunity. Uh, it affects the sense of appetite. It affects metabolism. And it produces short-chain fatty acids that can uh, modulate phenotypic plasticity of cells. We just heard from Dr. Scherer about the phenotypic plasticity uh, of adipocytes and adipocyte-like cells. So uh, we're going to do two things in the context of uh, recovery. Uh, the 16S uh, 
characterization, which is essentially one of the ribosomal, ribosomal RNA genes, uh, tells us about uh, taxonomy of what bacterial uh, species uh, are, are present and what is the relationship between the various species. There is a lot of literature on this. The problem with the literature on this is that it is inconsistent. Uh, there are uh, well-known alterations in the ratio between firmicutes and bacteroides in the intestine uh, in individuals with obesity and diabetes. But again, there is inconsistency in the literature. Um, we're going to do something a little more uh, in-depth than that, which is metagenomics, essentially looking at uh, what metabolic pathways the bacterial species as individual species and as a community are going to have active uh, in the intestine of individuals uh, with uh, um, PASC. And I want to remind you that the intestine is an active site of viral replication. So the viral replication itself might interfere with the microbiome. That's going to tell us a little bit more, hopefully, uh, about bacterial metabolites that may enter the circulation and affect the processes that we've heard about uh, during the presentations um, before this. Uh, another thing that we've heard a lot about is immune dysfunction uh, and chronic inflammation. Now, this can well be characterized through omics, specifically uh, with high throughput proteomics, it is possible to do two things. To measure uh, virtually all cytokines and adipokines, uh, present in a sample of, of plasma, and also uh, to measure autoantibodies that may be involved uh, in consequences such as uh, uh, post-COVID Graves disease that Dr. Rosen described. Uh, this should be complemented by high throughput immune phenotyping, uh, at least in a subset of patients through things like CYTOF that are going to tell us exactly what immune populations are uh, uh, present in individuals with different clinical manifestations of PASC. Uh, additionally, endothelial damage. Now, there are other ways to measure endothelial damage, but VEGF uh, 1, 2, and 3 are involved uh, uh, in a number of processes, including response to endothelial damage. And this is one of the things that uh, should probably be tracked. Uh, the important issue with some of these measures is that they should be done longitudinally in time. A single time point isn't really going to tell us very much. Um, now, there's something also that we haven't talked about that's obviously dear to my heart, which is what is the role of individual genetics? Uh, comorbidities, of course, contribute as uh, uh, risk factors uh, to, the, the, um, to the variety of consequences of acute COVID, but is there a polygenic risk score for PASC and is there a polygenic risk score for gastrointestinal and or metabolic manifestations of PASC? These are questions that could be asked uh, using GWAS uh, approaches. Now we've heard from Dr. Scherer about the role of adipose tissue and its phenotypic plasticity. That calls in my mind uh, for potentially single cell RNA-seq uh, in proteomics slash transcriptomics, not only on plasma, but possibly even on, on, on adipocytes. Um, now, I want to remind everyone also, as I said earlier, that adipocytes are a major source of VEGF. Now, VEGF is a key stimulus to the production of myeloid-derived suppressor cells uh, in the bone marrow. Now, these cells, uh, as, as many of you know, or all of you know, are essentially immature myeloid cells uh, that uh, 
migrate to sites of injury and chronic inflammation and, and release mediators that are primarily immune suppressive. Uh, the production of these is stimulated by VEGF, which is produced by both endothelial, uh, uh, damaged endothelial cells and adipocytes. We actually years ago published that, at least in an obese mouse model, the, project, the production of VEGF is higher uh, and it, it does in fact stimulate production of MDSCs. What is the role of endothelial damage and adipose tissue derived VEGF in the chronic inflammation that results in end organ damage, including potentially damage to the islets, uh, damage to muscles uh, and damage to endocrine organs. And uh, these are all questions that I would love to uh, discuss with the group and that could result in, in follow-up studies. And I have additional slides, but these simply summarize what we've talked about so far, and I believe they are redundant. So I'd like to thank our discussants and our panelists. And we can also um, take a second to, uh, Dr. Mele, if you can pull up your slide really quick. Some of the points that you had on that last slide, I'd like to open that up to the panelists to discuss uh, some additional of of those questions that you had posed there. This um, one? Yes, that would be great. Um, if, if any of the panelists would like to uh, chime in on, on some of these uh, questions posed here, that would, uh, this would be a good time for that. Well, maybe just a very quick uh, comment since I'm the, the fat person here <laughs> in charge. Uh, I, I think uh, adipose tissue obviously offers a lot of possibilities for further study. It really needs to be defined. We were hoping that we might be able to present uh, today some, some new data. We weren't quite ready, but um, there is a new factor that we've all been dealing with that is we refer to as endotrophin, which is a potent uh, fibroinflammatory marker. And we just are looking now at the impact of infection uh, on, on the circulating levels of this marker. And we'll hope to be able to report that. But of course, I've mentioned leptin, I've mentioned uh, adiponectin as also a factor that's critically affected. It, adiponectin goes down during an infection, uh, and all of these will, will have a pretty profound impact on long-term outcomes and the relative local uh, microenvironment of adipose tissue with its impact on systemic insulin sensitivity as well. Is endotrophin a protein? That is a protein, indeed, and it's a cleavage product of collagen 6-alpha-3 um, that we have uh, great hopes for as a marker and as a contributing profibrotic uh, factor. So that could uh, be revealed by proteomic approaches? It could only be revealed by proteomic approaches and less so by uh, RNA-seq because it's a post-translational cleavage product. And, and, and just to sort of weigh in, so general, general um, you know, whether you're looking at it from the lens of diffuse endothelial injury or, or, or systemic inflammation and the role of the adipocyte, a couple of comments, um, where, wherever you have that diffuse endothelial injury or inflammation, you're going to have some endothelial uh, fibrosis that mm -hmm. is then going to interact with circulatory um, uh, dynamics of tissue function. So maybe the, uh, the, the, the brain fog, the cardiac function, you know, all, all of these things can, can, can interplay. And I, I feel I'd love to follow up on the um, sort of quick mm -hmm. side glance you gave to thiazolidine dione. So you know, um, that I, I'm really intrigued because one of the things that's unique about COVID is that obesity is a factor for premature mortality in a COVID infection, but in, in, in some of the other uh, sepsis literature, obesity, it has a, it, it's got a, it, it doesn't have an increased impact on mortality. 
And so I'm, I'm really intrigued by, by you know, the thiazolidine diones. And are you looking at them as a, as, as a tool to improve adipose health, even if it is, even in this situation of chronic infection? Yes, I mean, improvement of uh, adipose tissue health is one key issue. The thiazolidine uh, uh, dions are unfortunately very old fashioned by now and everybody's trying to run away from them. <laughs> but we have to bear in mind that they, they do an awful of, a lot of things that would be beneficial in this context. Um, we think of the insulin sensitizing aspect of thiazolidine dions first and foremost, but we have to bear in mind their potent antifibrotic and also anti-inflammatory actions uh, due to PPA gamma. So I think it really combines in many areas, everything we want um, in this context in a very broad sense. Unfortunately, they are not very, um, given now that we all gather around the latest generation of dual agonists in the GLP-1, GIP um, uh, area, uh, who wants to go back to thiazolidine dions after what they've been through and on, on the cardiac side effects, which turned out to be not as relevant as we thought. So I think these are very viable, uh, potent um, uh, interventions still that have not been explored to a sufficient extent and just... Um, for declaration of conflict. I have no conflict of <laughs> not working with anybody who is in the market for uh, PPA gamma agonists. This is strictly from a basic science perspective, going down the list of what we want to happen in adipose tissue. I mean, drug repurposing is, is always a viable idea if it's safe. So about the brain fog, uh, we, and by we, I mean our pathology group, uh, have a long series of autopsies uh, from uh, victims of acute COVID-19. Uh, and I've looked at those slides. Uh, what I can tell you is that there is a very diffuse and very evident endothelial damage throughout the brain. Uh, it, it's, I mean, I, I'm not a pathologist and, I, and I, I couldn't miss it in the slides. So, if anything like that happens uh, in non-lethal cases of acute COVID, uh, we really do need to look into endothelial injury as a one of the central mechanisms of this that, that could essentially cause many of the, many of the um, consequences we've talked about so far. Yeah, and Joel Trinity at, at the Utah part of our, reco our recover site, um, has done a lot of non-invasive assessment of diffuse endothelial injury, including brain perfusion, showing uh, decreased brain perfusion as well as lower extremity perfusion um, and, and just regular old flow media vasodilatation in PASC survivors uh, versus non-PASC COVID survivors. There are seven questions in the q and I can see. Yes, I was actually going to jump to that uh, right now. So one of the questions that kind of piggybacks on the discussion that we have just been having is, um, are there known or studied methods for repairing the endothelial injuries caused by an acute infection, at least beyond the body's natural cellular healing mechanisms, which may be hindered by the multi-systemic injuries? So, so, you know, it, it may sound kind of counterintuitive, and of course you could expect this answer from me, but it would be um, exercise. And there is actually even a, a methodology um, using sort of inspiratory pressure that's been used in very sick um, dialysis patients to improve endothelial function. So, you know, yes, it, it, probably we would like people to get up, get moving and start exercising. That's the best way to improve your endothelial health been shown originally in PAD in peripheral arterial disease, but now, now we and others have shown it in, in diabetes, in hypertension, et cetera. 
But um, trying to say meeting somebody where they are in terms of acute COVID syndrome, um, uh, and it has initials, and I never remember initials because I have dyslexia, but it's an inspiratory um, exercise of the diaphragm, and, it, and it's had systemic um, improvement in endothelial markers in aging as well as in dialysis populations. Also, there are drugs, but I'll let other people talk about that. including thiazolidine downs. <laughs> I do like the exercise idea. So another question that uh, came in during the presentation is, <clears throat> you know, how can these findings be helpful for primary care doctors in their treatment of patients with long COVID? Huh. Well, we don't really know how to treat long COVID yet. We, <laughs> so we, we hope to learn it through recover. Uh, you know, I, 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 at this stage, the treatment is gonna have to be uh, uh, targeted to the particular consequences uh, of long COVID. So if somebody develops uh, diabetes as a result, uh, then the diabetes needs to be managed and so on and so forth. Uh, we don't have a treatment for long COVID yet. Yeah, and I, I think awareness of what dysfunction could occur, endocrine dysfunction besides glucose intolerance, a number of other factors that we've outlined may be important. So I think for primary care physicians, it's important to do a full workup, pretty much what we're doing in recover in terms of trying to identify uh, potential pathogenic factors that could contribute to symptomatology. Yeah, I think from the primary care perspective as well, it's important to realize that in young people, sometimes the diabetes is actually the first symptom of COVID in people. So if somebody comes in with no like known history of diabetes and suddenly comes in with symptoms of hyperglycemia, then they may actually have COVID. I see a question on, is there a list of long COVID symptoms? There actually is now. It's a long list. Uh, and I, I, I'm taking that one because one of my hats is biomedical informatics. So there's a very nice paper by Emily Pfaff and uh, co-workers on the N3C data set that has identified a series of uh, ICD-10 codes. So this is very relevant from the standpoint of primary care uh, that are associated with long COVID manifestations. Uh, it, they broke it down into three major groups, one of which is GI and metabolic, what we're talking about today. The other one is cardiorespiratory, and the third one is neurologic. There is a root ICD-10 code, which I believe is D9.9, uh, yeah. yes. and a series of codes in association with that uh, can actually tell you how likely it is that somebody has long COVID. Uh, if they're of new onset. Thank you. Um, there's another question here that says, I understand that minerals often are dysregulated in long COVID, but I don't quite understand the mechanism that is depleting minerals such as potassium. Uh, is there any uh, evidence or studies that, that link this um, as well? Yeah, I, I, I'm not aware of anything beyond, uh, you know, acute COVID illness can cause multiple uh, mineral uh, changes, particularly as they are acutely ill. And uh, if they're being treated with insulin and the potassium can go down, they, there's a number of other factors, uh, diuretics that can change potassium. Uh, I'm not aware of any changes in magnesium other than what we see with acute illness. Um, and as far as I know, I have not seen any data in long COVID as to what uh, potential mineral elements are there. Um, uh, we do get, we do measure calcium in the uh, recover in tier one, um, uh, but there's no evidence currently that uh, certain calcium levels are low. Um, one thing that has been reported that got a lot of press this week was a report of hypercalcemia 
very high calcium for an individual getting uh, more than 100,000 units of vitamin D a day for, uh, for a, a long COVID. Um, so there is that potential risk of developing side effects from medications that probably are, are not effective. Thanks. There's also another question that says, a lot of the data shown was associated with early COVID variants. Is there any evidence that it can be extrapolated to the newer Omicron variants? The symptomology is very different. Uh, is there the same incidence of diabetes, stratification of severity, and past risk based on age, race, um, et cetera? The short answer is we don't know yet. Oh, we don't know because Omicron is still changing. Uh, we just saw what may be uh, among the first instances of two newest subvariants around here. Uh, this is gonna have to be looked at retrospectively, but, but there is work ongoing in that uh, matching clinical uh, uh, phenotypes with subvariants. Uh, I can tell you that uh, even within subvariants of Omicron, there are um, differences in, pro in uh, predicted T cell epitopes. So their immunogenicity is going to be different. Uh, this is, will require a lot of work. Yeah, the, the, there was a, a recent paper suggesting that PASC is slightly less common in Omicron at six months. But what do you really know about exactly when? It, does that mean that it's going to be less common, or does that mean it didn't happen yet? And I mean, so I, I think that these are the questions that, you know, frankly, recover is not an epidemiological study. It is really all about mechanism, and we have to keep our our eyes on on the goal here. We're investing a lot of money, and participants are investing a lot of time. We have to really make sure that whatever questions we can address with Recover, we are going after them. I think with age, like we saw that in that paper with from the group at uh, UPenn, where they looked at the statistics over the different waves, that the mortality in the oldest group definitely declined later improved, I should say, um, over time with the different waves, but that was probably related to vaccinations in the different groups over time. So there has been a, a definite improvement in survival with older people, but it's probably vaccination related. Right, and still not clear whether vaccination reduces the risk of long COVID. So there's another question here that says, there's recently been a lot of work about the role of the mitochondria in long COVID and other post-infection conditions. Are there any evidence for um, the role of mitochondria in regulating the metabolics of patients with long COVID? I think that when you have as much sarcopenia post COVID, you would expect that you would have decreased mitochondrial function. And that's where Lucio's um, data on the met met metabolomic profiles, particularly the, un the sort of semi-targeted metabolomic profiling may offer some really key insights there. Yeah, and, and John Kerwin has some data that uh, oxidative phosphorylation is impaired in some of the T cell function in individuals that go on to have sustained uh, disease beyond 28 days. So depending on the tissue, there may be significant differences in respiratory uh, capacity. I remember early on there were papers coming out on like metformin and improved outcomes. I, I don't know if anybody has a comment on whether that has panned out or if there's any sort of mitochondrial effects of metformin that might've changed outcomes. Um, so Caroline um, uh, Bermonte, who is part of the N3C diabetes domain with me, she has, a, I don't know if it's in press or out paper with metformin um, in terms of outcomes, and she has a 1500 person cohort that she's going to be reporting on soon. Um, uh, the the what, news specific byline, you know, before the official uh, FDA paper release um, looks exciting. <laughs> 
So there's another question that says, um, is there any research completed or ongoing research regarding weight gain in long COVID patients that may be unexplained by some of these other factors or maybe related to some of the metabolic uh, topics that we've discussed today? I think that's gonna be a very difficult one to deconvolute because there are so many things coming together in long COVID yeah. Yeah. that it is nearly impossible to put uh, the finger on a specific uh, COVID, long COVID induced weight gain. I think it's very likely, but that will be difficult to prove convincingly a direct relationship to that. And Lucio might be in a better position to uh, comment on, on, on the statistics behind that. So uh, to the extent that it has been looked at in the N3C cohort, uh, new onset obesity was one of the codes uh, uh, that were part of the metabolic constellation of long COVID. However, it, the, the, the me mechanisms could be multiple. It could simply be due to inactivity yeah. because yeah. of fatigue. So it, we, we don't really know that there is a direct link, uh, but that's something definitely worth studying. And there have been a number of studies really focusing on uh, weight gain over the course of COVID now uh, without a consensus at the end of the day. There are papers that will argue for an increase in overall weight. But I think there are just as many papers that will argue that the net increase in weight gain and loss um, is actually no different uh, from a period preceding the three years before COVID. So I, I think this is going to be a difficult one because it's a very heterogeneous response as well. We have unquestionably individuals that have gained weight and there are individuals that have lost weight <laughs> during that time. And uh, whether or not this was an a function of infection versus uh, lifestyle changes uh, over the time beyond that is going to be a tough one. Um, the only the only group where it's been a little more consistent is youth. So in the kids, there does not specifically related to whether they had the burden of a COVID infection, but out throughout the pandemic, there has been more weight gain in kids. Agreed. Yeah. That is true. So we have one follow-up question um, to the response about endothelial repair. So exercise intolerance is a common symptom of uh, patients with long COVID. Um, and this is understood to be related to, you know, overactive sympathetic responses. Um, is the inspiratory device more of a parasympathetic support form of exercise? Mm -hmm. And can this paradox be uh, addressed a little bit more? Well, so, so that's a big question that our lab is trying to unravel in diabetes. Um, but I would just say that this does appear to increase parasympathetic tone, or at least RR variability. Um, I, I haven't yet done it. We have a proposal that just got a good score. So maybe we will be doing it in, in um, youth with type two um, and maybe we'll do it in this group. But it seems, it seems that when you're taking a re relatively frail or deconditioned population, it's good to start with an exercise intervention that's both portable and also not overwhelming to them. So I, I, I like its odds of being potentially useful and it should, although I, I really, the, the data from the aging population, you know, the, the push in the RR variability was really, it was statistically significant, but whether it was clinically significant is hard to say. Um, we'd like to thank all of our presenters today and thank you to our audience for attending the seminar and engaging with the Q and A. Um, as a reminder, a recording of today's seminar will be available on recovercovid.org within a few weeks. Uh, we will also be posting a Q&A document that has responses to the questions that we received today that we were not able to address during the, our allotted time. Um, we also want to note that today we had a focus uh, heavily on metabolic function in PASC and in future sessions we'll, we'll have a focus also on the, the GI function that we didn't cover um, as much today. Um, this slide lists the topics for future sessions. 
So our three seminars are on the second and fourth Tuesdays of the month from 12 to 1.30 Eastern time. Uh, we have some exciting topics coming up and we hope to see you at these future sessions. And with that, we thank you and hope you have a great day.